this story may be distressing to some viewers, so discretion is advised. This happened when I was at high school. I belonged to a basketball club and developed a huge crush on a senior at said club. We ended up getting very close and often met in private together. On a date we both had off from school, he called me up asking me if I wanted to come over and hang out. Of course, I was over the moon to be invited to his home, so I asked for his address straight away. Actually, I'm outside your house right now. Why don't you come out and I'll take you there? I went out there as fast as I could. Sure enough, there was a car waiting outside our family home. But there was some weird guy I had never seen before, sat with my crush in the car. I got in the car anyway, and he spun around. He said to me, let's go have some fun. With that, we pulled away from my home, and I wondered where the hell we were going, or what the hell we were going to do. As the car rumbled through the countryside roads, the car suddenly stopped, and my crush blurted out, I have something to do. I'll be back as soon as I can. He left the car and left me there. Oh God, why are you leaving now? I said that in my head, but I trusted that he would be right back just as he said he would. I felt lost and confused, but I tried to just enjoy the drive as the other guy picked it back up. After a while, the car stopped, and we arrived at a house that I knew was not my crush's house. The name played outside was something completely different. The guy in the car then asked, why don't we go in and have a drink while we wait for him to come back? I felt obliged to accept his offer, as he was friends with my crush apparently. When we went inside though, I could tell immediately something was wrong. I was getting a very bad vibe. Loads of my new acquaintance's friends were sat around a table. It freaked me out. Why was I brought here, I wondered. The people there were being very nice to me though. Before long, night arrived, and I had mentioned a few times my desire to go home before it got too late. No one really batted an eyelid to this request though. I really started to worry now, so I kept stating that I wanted to go home ASAP. I got an incoming call from my mom, and one of the guys there started to go crazy at me when I excused myself to try and answer it. He snatched the phone right out of my hand. This was no longer a friendly or normal situation. The man who took my phone told me I would not be going anywhere. I judged the situation as best I could and came to the conclusion that I had been brought here by my crush to these strange men. Perhaps they were small-time Yakuza, or something like that. It seemed as if I would be spending the night here, possibly much longer. My heart ached, and I just wanted to see my parents again. It was a feeling I wouldn't wish on my worst enemies. Before I knew it, I was bawling my eyes out. They ushered me into another room, and told me to go to sleep. I tried to think on my feet. I opened the door as quietly as I could, and listened in on the men's conversation. From what I could hear, it went something like this. We'll get a good price for her from the Koreans. The poor girl, huh? I couldn't believe I was listening to them discussing my future. After they finished talking, they came upstairs and locked my door. I got in the bed. There wasn't anything else I could really do. I had resigned myself to my fate and come to the terms with the idea that I wouldn't see my parents or friends ever again. I tried to psychologically prepare for whatever would happen next. I saw the early light of morning and I needed to go to the bathroom. I knocked on the door and someone came to open it. My heart was pounding again. I don't want to have to do this, but if you try to escape or go somewhere I can't see you, then... He trailed off, but his threat was obvious. I won't try to escape, I whimpered. As I said those words, I apologized from the bottom of my heart to my parents. Life in abduction went on this way for a week, until one night I was forcibly woken from my sleep and dragged out to a car so violently by the man who'd picked me up originally. 
I was thrown in and the engine started. We pulled away, and I had no idea where we were headed. To the Korean side, I'd guess. It had been so hard in these last days and nights to escape reality. I couldn't even comfort myself with family memories, as it would have just been too painful. I was losing my mind. I was ready to die. I couldn't physically cry anymore. I was absent-mindedly gazing out of the passenger side window when I started to notice a million things from my neighborhood. The car then pulled to a stop right in front of my house. Go, said the man. I got out and he pulled away into the night. He must have felt some sympathy for me, I guess, or his conscience kicked in or something. To this day, I have no idea what caused his change of heart. I was dumbstruck to be returning home safely. I went inside my family home, a place I thought only moments ago I'd never see again. My mother rushed downstairs. She must have heard me come in. She was so angry because I was young and stupid. I thought telling her about what happened to me would get me in more trouble or make her worry, so I just told her I'd been staying with a friend the whole time. She screamed at me for not getting in touch with her once during the last week. My mother still doesn't know what happened, and it's ten years later. I went back to school after, and I couldn't find a single trace of my crush, that senior who'd gotten me into that mess in the first place. He must have ditched town before handing me over to those men. I hope he can sleep at night, but I hope he's tormented and tortured by his guilt. It was truly a terrifying event, but I'm very lucky to say I'm living well these days. I'm living happily as well. This happened last January. I had taken a week off from work following New Year's, mostly in the hopes that everyone else would be back at work by then, and I could enjoy the week without it being very busy everywhere and having to work all by myself. My plans consisted of shopping around and really just chilling at my apartment by myself. On the day this happened, I was out driving around in the snow, making my way to a few stores. I then made my way back to my apartment by 7pm. I went inside and cooled off, then took a seat on the couch with some snacks I'd just gotten. I was watching TV and even dozing off a little bit from the long day out from the house, when at some time around 8.30 or so, the PA system in my apartment buzzed, meaning that someone was outside and wanting me to let them into the building. I had no plans for anyone coming over so I had no idea who it could possibly be. They buzzed my room again and again, so I got up and went to the window that faced the front of the building. I tried not to lift the blinds too much, only enough for me to peek out and see who it was at the door to the apartment building. There was a large man outside. It was still snowy out and kind of dark, but I could tell he was older, mid-forties or so. I could also tell I had never seen him before in my life. There were only three other people living in the complex at the time, so I was at least familiar with everyone who lived here, and he was definitely not one of them. I also figured that if he did live here or was visiting one of the other people, then surely they would let him in instead. I walked over to the PA system and muted it, then got back on the couch and continued watching TV, I really didn't put any more thought into it, and even dozed off several times in the next hour. Eventually, I shut off the TV and went to bed. By then, it had to be around 10 or so. I fell asleep just about as soon as I laid down. A few hours further into the night, my eyes shot open once I heard a thud from just outside my room. It was extremely loud, but having just woken up to it, I didn't know what it was or exactly where it came from. My heart was racing as I stared across the room at my door, listening for anything else. It was very quiet now, almost like nothing had even happened. I got out of bed and slowly moved toward the door, then leaned my ear in against it to listen to the other side. 
It was still quiet, nothing more than the walls creaking from the building. I turned the handle and looked out into the living room, not seeing anything out of the ordinary. The whole place was really dark, and for some reason I still felt like I needed to be very quiet and not make myself known. I left the lights off as I moved through the living room and looked down the front hallway to the door to my apartment. In that moment, I realized it was fully open. I froze, staring at the now open doorway and feeling fear run through my whole body. It almost didn't seem real. I took a few steps back, staying quiet, and made my way back toward my own room. Now, on the other side of the door, I could see a huge dent in the wood right by the knob. Once I saw that, I ran in and locked it behind me, then called 911 while hiding in the closet. I was sure that whoever it was had to be somewhere inside my apartment still, and it would only be a matter of time before they got into my room. As I waited for the police to arrive, the apartment stayed silent, however. Whoever had broken in was seemingly gone. Even the police couldn't find anything to help once they arrived. What they think happened is the intruder had tried buzzing all the other rooms as well, until one of them was nice enough to let them in. Once he was in the main stairwell, it's not really clear why he chose to go for my room specifically. Maybe they thought it was empty. What's really strange is the dent on my bedroom door, which was likely the source of the thud I'd woken up to. It was just from one single hit, though. Not like a real attempt at breaking the door down, but more like something someone would do out of frustration before leaving. I still live in the same apartment, and nothing else has happened. Who it was and what they wanted is still unknown. This happened to me years ago when I was a new nurse. I was in my 20s and had just started working in an old folks home. We had a resident who I'll call Bob. I didn't have an opinion of him really. He mostly kept to himself. He really just seemed like a regular old man. He was in his 70s and had several health problems, but he seemed happy and fairly normal. One day, it was just him and I and I had to give him his medication. He had this photo album open on his lap, and he was grinning at the photos. Now, I've always made conversation with the residents, and I'd had normal chit-chat with Bob before. I asked him if he was reminiscing about something. He looked up at me and said yes. I asked him if he missed his family, as I noticed that he never had any visitors. He kept smiling and told me that his friends were his family, and they're all gone now. Our conversation went on, and when I was about to leave, he asked if I would like to see this photo album of his. Of course, I agreed. But what Bob showed me made me feel sick. The photo album was one of those flip ones, where it's a row of plastic files you can slip a photo in so you can see several at once. The photos were all of naked women, and they were all clearly in distress as well. They were bleeding and looked like they'd been beaten up severely. Pain and humiliation was etched all over their faces. They were bound and gagged in disgusting poses. One woman in particular, it felt like she was staring right into my soul, like she was really right in front of me pleading for help. The look in their eyes is what really got under my skin. I felt sick. My blood literally ran cold. I didn't know what to say. I knew Bob couldn't exactly hurt me because he was too weak and old, but I also had this thought that if I reacted in a certain way, he'd get off on it. It was like in that moment I just realized what a sick and deeply disturbed man Bob was. He stared at my face, obviously waiting for a reaction that I did my best not to give. It felt like hours passed, but it was probably less than a minute or two. He looked away from me and back to the photos, holding the album like he was presenting a priceless artwork. He smiled at the photos and told me in a wistful voice that he used to be in a biker gang. Those women were the stock. 
He said that him and his friends could fuck them whenever they wanted. I must admit that in that moment I felt like knocking Bob out, but I knew I had to remain calm. Something told me he would get off on it if I started shouting at him. Instead of doing anything, I just left the room without a word. I didn't know what to do, really. I still had other medications to give out, so I finished that first. I then took a minute to myself and thought that if I was a smoker, now would be the perfect time to light one up. I was angry after Bob's revelation. Whether the story was true or not, he clearly loved hurting women to have those photos in such an album. I decided to tell a higher up. They checked Bob's room and somehow they never found the album itself. I know 100% sure that I didn't imagine it nor was it a dream though. I have no idea where Bob hid it or the photos, but he must have known I'd report the incident. He must have stashed them somewhere. I just don't know where. Of course, they didn't search until later the next morning at like 10 a.m., so I suppose he had plenty of time to hide them away. I continued giving Bob his meds, and he never acted differently. I was always very reserved towards him after that, though. Those photos still trouble me to this day, and I believe they'll haunt me forever. I wonder how many of those girls are missing today. Are they even alive? Was he a kidnapper or what? I just don't know. I've heard stories of gang members using women like objects and abusing them. But I don't really know much about it. It's a messed up world we live in, and I try not to think too much. Memories like this have a way of rearing their ugly head occasionally though. I wonder why Bob even decided to show me these. Did he want to relive his past and thought showing me and making me freak out would be fun? What would have happened if I started shouting at him? These are answers I'll never have. I'll never understand how someone can be so twisted and depraved like that. At the end of the day, all I can really do is pray for the women in those photos, that they're at peace now wherever they are. I was in my senior year of high school about 10 years ago. I grew up as a sort of outcast. I wasn't bullied or anything, but I also didn't really have any friends. I didn't mind that solitary lifestyle, though. I went through school, then would come home and play video games and lose myself in digital worlds. That was my escape, so to call it. My home life wasn't what I would call bad either. It was just my dad and I, and I loved my dad a lot. He worked so much to provide for me, and when I was young, maybe 10 or 11 years old, my mom got involved with some bad people and their hobbies, if you know what I mean. My dad didn't want to expose me to that world anymore, and we eventually moved away. It was quite messy, but it was for the best. He tried getting her help throughout the years, but she always turned it down. That was all until one day when she just went off the grid completely. It was sad, but we both moved on, and when I got older, he would have to leave for the weekend once a month for his job. I didn't really mind, though. It may seem crazy to people to leave someone at that age home alone for a weekend, but my dad trusted me a lot. One specific weekend during senior year, when my dad had left for the night, I started my normal routine. My pops would leave some money behind in order to order some pizza and some soda. We never had soda in the house normally, so getting a two liter with the pizza was like a double treat for me. My night was beginning to play out just like every other night I was home alone. I demolished the pizza and drank most of the soda and after a little breather on the couch, I went to my room and started playing some PlayStation. And that's how I spent most of my weekends, even if my dad was home. I would usually play Call of Duty, but Grand Theft Auto Online had just come out, so I had been spending quite a bit of time playing that. After a few hours of that, I decided to play the single-player story mode. The older I got, I seemed to play the story mode in games less, 
but for some reason on this night, I wanted to play something with some more substance, even if it was GTA. Since I wasn't playing online anymore, I took my headphones off. As much as I game, I hate wearing headphones for long periods of time. They really hurt my ears, you know. I'd been playing for a little while, when I thought I could hear something coming from downstairs. There weren't any loud or crazy noises, really. It was just these sort of small vibrations and little bumps. Now, I've been home alone a ton of times, and I didn't remember ever feeling any of those vibrations or hearing any small noises like that. At the same time, though, it was such a small noise that it wasn't alarming enough for me to actually freak out. It was a little after one in the morning. I think it's in all our subconsciouses to be a little on edge when you're home alone at that hour. Every few moments, I would hear this little scuffling noise. I paused the game and tried to listen in. When I listened, I would mostly just hear more silence, maybe an occasional little bump or something. Because I was home alone, of course the quick thought of an intruder crossed my mind. I'm embarrassed to say, though, that at some point I thought to myself that ghosts could be causing this. I debated back and forth with myself about this for about 30 minutes. Finally, I paused the game and went over and sat in my computer chair to just listen in fully for a few minutes without listening to the sound of gameplay or anything else. I noticed that the sounds were happening more regularly now, those little bumps and such. I'd initially blamed it on cracking pipes or house noises, but they started to happen more and more often. The little vibrations I could feel were now happening almost every second. It was like my dad might be downstairs, but the only thing missing was hearing his voice. The thought of my dad coming home early had crossed my mind, but he would have called me or at least poked his head in the room to see if I was still awake. Was I just being paranoid? Was I getting myself all worked up for nothing? I decided I had to go downstairs and check it out to prove to myself that nobody was in the house. Clearly, I was just letting my imagination run away from me. I crept slowly down the upstairs hall and made my way to the top of the staircase. While I was slowly heading in that direction, the muffled sounds were getting much louder and I started to fear the worst. I thought of calling the police. I was too anxious in that moment though. In my mind, I was thinking to myself, what if nobody's there and I waste the police's time? When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw light illuminating the dark walls coming from the other side of the house. The kitchen light was on. It's possible I'd done that myself, but I was fairly certain I had shut the light off before heading upstairs. I was practically crawling my way to the kitchen. I was moving slowly. When I was only a few feet away from the kitchen doorway, I could hear what sounded like someone rummaging through my cabinets. That was accompanied by a soft humming voice. I was half expecting to see some big, burly, scary burglar, but the voice indicated something else entirely. I peeked my head around the corner, when next to the kitchen sink, I saw a very small woman. Her hair was extremely wild, flowing out in every direction. I had my phone in hand ready to call the police. The situation had me frozen in terror, but also incredible curiosity. I realized that this woman was singing Disney songs to herself. I almost fainted right there, because instinctively I knew who this person was. It was my mom. She was singing the same song she would sing to me when I was very young. It was one of the only memories of my mother I actually had left. I couldn't move. I must have been trembling because she heard me. She turned around and a big smile lit up her face. Even though this was my mom, it was not the woman I remembered. Her teeth looked rotten and her eyes looked like they were sunken into her face. A voice that should have been soothing was now unnerving. There's my baby. What are you doing awake at this hour? I didn't respond. I just stood there like a statue. She came over to me and put her dirty hands on my shoulder. What am I going to do with you? 
Your father, he's always changing out cabinets. I swear that man doesn't listen. She then started to laugh. But it wasn't charming or calming. It was like she wasn't really there. She turned back around and started humming, and started going through the cabinets again. I broke out of my trance and went to my room. I locked the door and called the police. I called my dad, too. My dad made sure I was in the bedroom with the door locked. He didn't give me any details, but he said there was a good chance my mother was dangerous and I needed to be safe just in case. The cops showed up and I heard an altercation start downstairs. I could hear my mom yelling at the police to get out of her house. The police knew the situation from myself and my dad, and I heard a brief struggle, then silence for a few moments. I heard a cop shout my name and tell me it was alright for me to come downstairs. I spoke with the police for a little while as another officer drove my mother away. One officer stayed parked outside my house all night until my dad came home to help me feel safer, which I really did appreciate. He spoke with one of the officers. I could tell by reading my dad's body language that he was uncomfortable and we were potentially fortunate to avoid something horrible happening. My mother actually had two knives on her when she was apprehended. One knife she must have had when she broke in, and the other knife was a sharp kitchen knife that belonged to my dad, which he'd stuck in her pocket when she was in the kitchen. She never used them, but the fact that she had them was enough to freak me out. The most terrifying part of this horrible nightmare, though, was that my mother had no idea where we lived. Well, she wasn't supposed to have any idea. We moved away, and we moved far away, my dad never told my mom where we'd moved to protect me. She'd broken into the house by breaking one of the downstairs windows and crawled in. I didn't hear it at all, so that must have been when I still had my headphones on or something. The thought of my mom just humming and walking around downstairs, potentially waiting for my dad, while I had no idea, still freaks me out to this day. It's been about 10 years now, and I've only seen my mother twice since that night. She's been in some type of institution for years now. She has no memory of that night, but in all fairness, she doesn't have much memory of anything at all. It's sad, but it's true. Every time I hear those Disney songs, I sort of freeze up. I just hope one day I can forget about the fear I felt that night and find a way to remember my mom in a more positive light. I used to have a weekly overnight babysitting job for a couple who frequently spent nights in another nearby city caring for one of their ailing parents. It was a pretty easy gig because they only had one kid who was an eight-year-old and was already pretty independent. I usually just played with him for a few hours and then got him ready for bed then got paid another 14 hours while I watched TV, raided their fridge, and slept on their couch. One thing I hated about the job, however, was the house. It was a somewhat modern house in the country. They had these big open windows, and the style was such that there weren't any curtains I could close. I just had to watch TV and live with the anxiety of knowing someone outside could easily watch in at me and I would have no idea. One night, I was sitting down in the living room when I thought I heard a strange noise. I turned the volume on the TV down, and sure enough, what I just heard was a slight tapping noise. I looked around and didn't see anything out of place, so I assumed it must be a noise from a tree or something outside. Every time I turned the volume back up, though, I heard that same tap, Finally, I turned off the TV altogether and started walking around the house. As my eyes adjusted to the darker room, I saw a man outside the window, fingernail pressed to the glass, making that tap, tap, tap noise. He was smiling at me. I freaked out and went upstairs to check on the kid. The worst part is that there was not a phone upstairs, so I had to creep back down to grab a phone and call the police. 
I tried to avoid looking back at the window, but I snuck a glance. Sure enough, he was still there, just watching me as calmly as ever. I locked myself and the kid in his bedroom and waited for the police to arrive. When they finally showed up, they never found any traces of someone around the house. I suspect they thought I was just some kid playing a prank on them, but I know the person I saw was a fully grown man. He was just stood there watching me, enjoying the fear he caused me to feel that night. I'm an 18-year-old guy who lives with his mom. We don't live in the house I grew up in, but we are in the same neighborhood as my grandma's house, and only a minute away from all our aunts, uncles, and cousins. It's always been a nice and happy area for me, because I grew up around here. To say it plainly, I love this place, and I feel comfortable almost everywhere in this city. Nothing bad has happened to me or any of my family members while we've lived in this town. It's close to the Gulf of Mexico, and it's full of chemical plants, thus workers from chemical plants and their families. Most people mind their own business and have a lot of respect for hard work and integrity. Of course, there are some crazies living here, though. There was a body recently found in a storage unit. It was a woman who was murdered by her husband. He wasn't charged because he committed suicide shortly after. A man who used to work at the same power plant I work at now was arrested for killing a woman with his car, then driving away. The point being that, sure, sometimes bad stuff does go on here, but most of the time, it's all okay. That's why I think this event was such a shocking thing to me. It was a typical Thursday. I woke up at 7am, went to work, and got off at 4. I went home and did all the normal stuff I usually do. Took a shower, played some video games, smoked a little weed, then ate dinner. Pretty good evening so far. My mom's friend April came over and stayed for a couple hours. She lives a block away and walked over, but didn't want to walk alone in the dark. My mom told me at around 9pm that she was walking April back to her house, and it would only take a few minutes at most. I said, alright, I'll see you when you get back. Then they left. No more than a minute later, I thought I heard tapping on my window. It was so light and inconsistent though, that I still didn't know if anyone was actually tapping. I felt a little paranoid, so I turned on some music to distract myself. I turned it down a minute or two later though, when I thought I heard my back door open. It's very loud because of how old it is, and because of how we always keep a spare key in the lock, which jangles every time it's opened. I turned my music off, and didn't make another noise for a whole minute. I didn't hear anything else, but I knew someone opened it. I knew someone was inside my house right now. I could just feel it in the air. I didn't hear footsteps or a voice or anything. It was completely silent. I was kind of scared, but I quickly told myself to grab the knife I keep in my desk drawer. I did feel a bit dumb because of the possibility I was just being paranoid, but better to be safe than sorry. Once again, it was silent for a while. I thought that if I acted like I had the upper hand over whoever was in the house, they might be intimidated or scared. I stood up and walked out of my bedroom, knife visibly in hand. I don't know why, but I whistled just one note. I took a few steps forward and was about to turn the corner. The back door would be in clear view. I stopped again and whistled once more, still thinking I was big and tough. I was about to walk around the corner and make a big show. I then heard something that made my hair stand on end. Whoever was inside my house whistled back to me, clearly coming from my living room. I was terrified. I peered around the corner and didn't see anyone there. The door was closed, but it was unlocked. I didn't know if I'd left it unlocked or not. I truly couldn't remember. My mom came home a few minutes later. 
and I didn't tell her because, I don't know, it was just weird and didn't make much sense. I really don't know what to think about what happened that night, but I know for sure someone whistled back to me. Even when I searched afterward, though, I could never find any evidence that anyone had ever been there. About five years ago, my husband Adam and I decided it was finally time to start looking to purchase a house. We had always talked about buying an old fixer-upper home, because we've had the idea that they hold more charm and character. Plus, we can appreciate a place that has its own quirks, and we love the thought of turning something run down into something beautiful again. With that being said, I grew up in a pretty rural farming town in Indiana, that had more than its fair share of run-down houses. The surrounding areas had started to boom a little bit with farmland being sold off and turned into new factory locations, along with new subdivisions for the people coming to work for them. I thought it would be a great place to start on our own house hunt. I figured we would be a lot closer to civilization than I used to be growing up, but not so much that we would be living a stone's throw away from our neighbors. Adam and I decided to take a drive one summer Sunday afternoon so I could show him some of the back roads of my hometown and also see what some of the properties we checked out online looked like in person. As we were turning off the main road through town and further onto a more secluded country road, we noticed the very first house on the left was completely abandoned we pulled into a small patch of the yard where the grass was shortest and where a gravel driveway used to be to further investigate this place. It was painted a deep green color, which made it almost invisible against the tall grass, sticker bushes, and weeds that had grown up around it. There was a massive tree in the front yard, and the branches and leaves helped to camouflage this place even further. The house looked as if it were at least a hundred years old, and it looked like it had sat empty for decades. It looked neglected, weather-worn, and in some major need of love. In that moment, it seemed perfect. There was nothing but woods across the street, and no neighboring houses in sight. Adam and I thought it probably wouldn't hurt anyone if we just trespassed a little. I completely justified my reasoning, by thinking that we were interested in buying this property. We were not here to cause trouble. We were doing someone a favor. We could take this burden of a house off someone's hands. We just needed to take a look around first. That's all. It's not like there were any no trespassing signs anywhere, so I was perfectly armed with my newfound, inflated, ignorant, and arrogance to assess the property. He walked carefully through the brush toward the left side of the house, where we noticed a well that was still standing, complete with a bucket, a rope, and a handle, and the original overhang as well. My excitement for a picturesque country home was building. Directly across from the well, there was a side entrance into the house, to what looked like an added-on mudroom. The screen door to the mudroom was closed. However, there was a wooden door behind it that was half open. We figured this was not really intrusive because we weren't breaking anything to get in. It was probably in the mid-90s outside that day, so when we entered, Adam went in first. We were met with this thick, stifling heat, the kind that holds so much humidity that it takes your breath away. What we thought was a mudroom was an extended pantry area, or canning kitchen. It was tiny with one window, an old rusted sink, a small stove, and the wall still held shelves of canned and spoiled vegetables. I remember thinking, oh yeah, this'll be great. I totally remember how to can, and we can have a garden as well. It had the doorway into the main part of the house. This is where my elation came to an end. Through the doorway was the kitchen. What remained of the cabinets and the sink were against the wall on the left, but they were either broken or hanging on for dear life. The kitchen connected to a wide open living area, with one side having walls streaked with black that led halfway up to a sunken gray ceiling. It seemed there had been a fire at some point. 
The windows on that wall were filthy, covered in dust and ash. This room was so much darker. It should have been the middle of the day, but it was pitch black in there. My heart sank. I knew we wouldn't be able to afford a costly repair of a house fire, but I kept that disappointing thought to myself. The open living room area had not one stitch of furniture, save for one small wooden rocking horse a child would have. The floor was littered with magazines as well, as if someone had a giant stack of them and just threw them in the air to see where they would land. Curious as to what was in this big pile, I decided to check them out. Almost every single magazine was related to dolls in some way. Porcelain doll collecting, Barbie dolls, making dolls by hand, clothing for dolls. I felt a little creeped out by it, especially under the surveillance of the rocking horse's dead painted on stare. I figured an old lady must have lived in the house before. We decided to check out another room that was connected to the half-burned living area. Through the doorway to the left was a weird combination of a molded stand-up shower with handicapped handles and an assisted toilet next to it, divided down the middle by a wall on the right. The wall was made entirely of built-in bookshelves. The shelves were full of paperwork, manila envelopes, and even more magazines. It was a weird setup, but perhaps these people liked to read while sitting on the toilet or something. My husband and I thought we could find out who the previous homeowners were, since some of the paperwork on top of the stack seemed to be old bills. If we wanted to look up the property records, at least now we would have a name to go on. I grabbed a stack of papers and began to flip through them, when about halfway through, they changed from being old telephone bills to print out colored pictures from the internet of porcelain dolls. I put the stack of papers back on the shelf, and picked up a small red five-star notebook. I started from the beginning, casually leafing through. Daily entries of medications, blood pressure, glucose measurements. About 20 pages in, the entries started to change entirely. They became crude drawings of twisted faces done in red ink. The faces had horns or bloody fangs. Then, full-on drawings of devils appeared. I wanted to believe a child had picked this up to doodle in, but I felt like this was something much different than that. After the drawings, the notebook became someone's personal journal, and what I assumed was an elderly man's cursive handwriting. It told of how he knew he was coming toward the end of his life, and how he remembered being just a young boy when his mother passed away. He described in detail how the wake for his mother was held in the front room of this house, and how during those nights he crawled on top of his mother's body in her coffin to sleep. I couldn't believe what I was reading. A sudden rush of goosebumps came over me. I immediately showed it to Adam, flipping to the pages of devils and snarled faces, then read aloud the stranger's memories, just to see if it was the same the second time around. While I was reading the rest of the notebook, he continued rifling through the mountains of papers. One stack not only had more printed pictures of dolls, but now they contained pictures of real women in torture bondage, ball gags or electrical tape placed over their mouths, jumper cables on them, being hogtied with rope. Sometimes there was more than one woman in the picture. It felt as if a brick had been tossed into my stomach. For some, those images wouldn't be disturbing, but in the context of our visit, my panic was starting to grow. I was torn between wanting to find out more and getting the hell out of this house. Adam reassured me that while it was on the creepy side, it wasn't anything to lose my mind over. The burned out living area was separated from the rest of the house by a staircase. The staircase had a room directly across from it and a small hallway on the other side that led to the main room at the front of the house. We debated on going up to the second floor, but decided against it. We already felt as if we were roasting in an oven and were unsure of the stability of this second story. Going into the room across the staircase, we noticed a few more doll magazines on the floor. There were also scattered plastic doll pieces here and there. To the left was the original fireplace with a couple tiny vases on the mantel. Smack dab in the middle was a framed picture of an elderly couple, smiling and happy. 
They certainly weren't the type of people that would have pictures of women bound and gagged hidden away in their bedroom. To the right was a big bay window, and smack dab in the middle was a yellowed piece of paper with faded black printed handwriting on it. It was for anyone on the outside of the house to see. It said, if you're here to talk about Jesus, go away. Something in my brain was now starting to nag me. Something wasn't computing correctly for me. Thinking back, my mind was putting together that an elderly couple in this town would more than likely be pretty religious, and by the super small chance they weren't, it would have been gossiped about for sure, had someone seen that in the window. It was as if the house had held two very different personalities within. I told my husband I wanted to go into just one last room down the little hallway, and then I would be ready to leave. Going down the small hallway, it became darker and cooler. It took a few seconds for our eyes to adjust to the difference in lighting in here, but the change in air was noticeable immediately. It was as if we had stepped into a cave. The smell was dank and left a dampness on our skin. Once things came into clear focus, that's when we saw it. The main reason our senses had shifted so quickly. There was a large hole in the floor. At first, we thought that perhaps the wooden floor was so weak it had simply caved in on its own, or the roof had leaked and caused this exact area of the floor to rot away. Upon getting closer, though, it became obvious this was not the case. The hole was about five feet across and went straight down into the earth. There was about two feet of space between the remaining floor and dirt. This hole was there because it had been made there. My husband and I looked at each other. My heart was racing so fast that I thought it would burst in my chest. I said aloud to him while pointing, What the hell is this? Why is this here? I panicked, my breathing becoming more rapid and shallow. Nothing was making sense, and yet the thoughts that had been running in the background of my brain were all coming together like a jigsaw puzzle. That was when we noticed something else. There were old, molded-over driver's licenses just thrown around haphazardly, checkbooks, credit cards, as if someone had emptied their purse or wallet in this room and then just disappeared into this hole. I was overcome with terror and dread. I had to get out of this house. My skin felt like static, as if my whole body had been taken over by the sensation of when your foot falls asleep. My mind just told me to run. Without having to speak, Adam quickly took me by the arm and led us back down the hallway through the burned-out living room and kitchen, out the side canning room, and back out into the light of day. We ran back down the mangled and tangled driveway to the car. Thinking back on it, I got the eerie feeling we weren't the only two people in the house that day. We drove past it about a year later, and the large tree in the front yard had all its branches removed. All of the windows had been boarded shut, and after doing some research, we found out the land it sits on is for sale, and the house itself had been condemned. 